Hi folks, welcome back to History and Politics Chat on Tuesday afternoons or evenings, depending on where you are, where I'm happy to take on some of your questions about modern day politics. Um, it looks like I'm up and running. There's some responses here, so I'll get right to it. I wanna remind you first of all who I am and what I'm doing here. My name is Heather Cox Richardson. I'm a professor of history. I started writing letters about modern day politics about six months ago and people have a lot of questions about them so i'm happy to to explain the longer questions that i can't cover at night here in facebook chats in part to while away time while we're all stuck at home in quarantine but i want to emphasize that i don't speak for my employer and that um i'm a historian so i'm trying to look at the longer sweep of history and um and then I will make mistakes because that's exactly how um, conversations happen. People say things, maybe they need to be corrected. Um, please feel free to do that. Do recognize that I don't have a staff. I am solely a single academic trying to answer your questions about how the American political system works, especially in the crises of today. Because we are at a crisis and not just because of the pandemic that's sweeping the world, but also because of where American politics is right now. So let me get down to some of your questions. And it was really frustrating because there were so many good questions and I've actually got six prepared to answer. I doubt I'll get through more than four, but that's all right because we got a long year ahead of us. All right, so let me start with a question from Jody Reed Stambau. I hope I got that right, Jody. Uh, Jody asked, how close are we to martial law? Which is a question that people ask me all the time. Let's start by saying that I wrote a number of days ago about how the Department of Justice has asked Congress for a suspension of the, the legal statutes of the laws related to arrests and to incarceration during a time of emergency, like a time we're in now, a time of pandemic. Uh, this raised a huge number of red flags. In fact, when I first read it, I didn't think it was real. I thought it was, um, you know, one of the many, many urban legends or false stories that are zooming around the, the internet nowadays. So I wrote about it, but I really downplayed it uh, and said, if this is true, I'm not sure it's going to be true. Well, it turned out it was true that the, that the Department of Justice did ask for that. Um, and in fact, this has happened. We have had the suspension of, um, of our, our, our protective laws during times of an emergency really dramatically in 1861 through the end of the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln suspended things like the writ of habeas corpus, which is your right to be, uh, to have a, the government give a reason for why you're arrested and to try you at a, at a, a, in a reasonable amount of time. We also had uh, the, sus the suspension of uh, legal protections and the rise of martial law in 1894 really dramatically across a lot of the country when there was a strike on major railroad lines. So it, it has happened in the past and I could come up with other things as well. But is it going to happen now? Is that going to happen now? I would say not in the sense that Congress is not gonna produce this kind of a law. And it's not just the Democrats who stand against the idea of the government taking on that sort of control of our laws, but also Republicans, especially the libertarian leaning. Uh, Mike Lee, for example, from Utah, who when the news broke of the Department of Justice requesting this new law or set of laws from Congress, he tweeted in capital letters, over my dead body. So is that sort of thing going to happen? Uh, is Congress going to say, yes, go ahead and take emergency powers on our on our approval? I think, and I think, I mean, I, I'm a prophet of the past, I'm not a prophet of the future. I, I, I think that it's a little early to worry about something like that. I will point out, because I'm a historian, that in fact, a Congress on the North American continent did once do exactly that. And that was the Confederate Congress. The Confederate Congress gave Jefferson Davis the power to declare martial law at will. And what happened instantly was that his military advisors rounded up political prisoners, huge numbers of political prisoners. And within, I think it was a year, it might've been a little bit more than that, the Confederate Congress went, you know what? Even if we are fighting a war for our very survival or establishment, we cannot have the executive have the ability to suspend habeas corpus and create military law at will. So is that going to happen right now? 
I'm not staying up at night worrying about that in particular, but I am staying up at night a lot worrying about other things. And that is the current breakdown of the rule of law in, um, in America, which has been on the table really since the, the, uh, the election of Donald Trump, or rather the inauguration of Donald Trump in January of 2016, when it was clear from the start, really from the very beginning with the travel ban, if you remember all that, you know, centuries and centuries ago, that he was not going to be going through normal legal channels and he was going to be making a lot of declarations. And over the last three years, the rule of law has pretty dramatically broken down. This is uh, a lot of the laws that we, the things that we thought were laws were in fact norms, but really the reason that I started writing about this with the letters was because on September 13th, we had a member of, of uh, 2019, we had Adam Schiff, a member of Congress, directly accusing a member of the executive branch of breaking a specific law. And this jumped out to me as the signal of um, this breakdown in laws. But, but for the first time, there was actually something with teeth, as opposed to the breaking of the Emoluments Clause, which is in the Constitution, which says you can't profit from the president. Now, somebody like me looks at, um, at, at somebody like uh, President Trump who has people staying in his hotels and are, are making money off that, and I say, well, he's breaking the emoluments clause. Well, I don't have any standing. That is, I can't take that to court, or at least it doesn't look like I could take that to court um, to, to enforce that part of the Constitution. So what was so important to me about what happened on September 13th was Adam Schiff said, I have a law right here and you have broken it and I can prove that. And it was a really simple law. So he really did have that and he really could do that. And he called out the executive on that. So the breakdown in the rule of law is really concerning. And it's really concerning, not simply because we have an executive, a president who is uh, much more accustomed to doing things by his own dictates than by following a set of rules. Because one person, can cause a lot of trouble for sure. But the real problem we're in right now is that it's not just Trump. There is a move in the branch, uh, in, in the government, in the executive branch among the Republican Party to change a lot of what have been our traditional laws. And this is gonna get a little complicated. I hope you are finding that in, this is somewhat interesting because I'm really going to drag you through the weeds here for a little bit with two important theories of government that many of you probably have never heard of, but that are the ones that are driving a number of the people who are currently in charge of our system right now. And the first of these is the theory of the unitary executive that is also known as the unitary executive theory. I mean, it's kind of obvious, right? Um, this is a theory that says the president as the head of the executive branch, remember there are three branches of government, the judicial, the legislative, and the executive, and that's the courts, the Congress, and the president. But the president as the head of the executive branch has the power to control the entire executive branch. That is, his word is the end. So, for example, you could not have within this unitary executive theory, you could not have within the Department of Justice, for example, uh, somebody who is going to investigate the president. You could not have um, a special prosecutor who, I mean, you could have one, but, but at the end of the day, he or she would be overruled by the president. The president's um, say is the, the final say. Well, Again, to somebody like me, that just sounds completely contrary to what the founders were trying to establish with the Constitution, which was really pretty deliberately an attempt to continue to vest the power of the government in the Congress. Um, the, the, our current Constitution was not nearly as uh, Congress friendly as the Articles of Confederation, which had been what had ruled America between the Revolutionary War and the establishment of the Constitution. But it was pretty clear those didn't work terribly well because if you gave too much power to Congress, um, and that there wasn't any kind of an executive um, a branch, what happened was that the uh, the the 
the various states started squabbling. They wouldn't work together. They tried to have a, their own independent foreign um, foreign treaties. And when that happened, um, people who were trying to do business overseas primarily and very concerned about the rise of New York as the premier port on the, the Atlantic co uh, coast got together and they said, we need a stronger kind of government. And so when they create the Constitution, they do, in fact, call for an executive and a pretty strong executive for the time, but they still vest the power of the government in the Congress, which is the body that represents the people. And after all, this is a democracy, a democratic republic. All right, so what happens is that if in fact, uh, the power of the, the government is vested in Congress, um, where did this theory come from? Well, the theory of the unitary executive comes largely in the modern era, comes from a decision from 1988, a Supreme Court decision from 1988, in which seven members of the court agree. And they agree um, uh, that there, there needs to be a check on, it's a complicated case, but, but they, they agree that, that Congress or that the executive can be checked. And Antonin Scalia writes a dissent. He writes, um, he writes the only dissent. He's the one in that case. And he advocates the idea of a unitary executive. He says that, in fact, the president holds all the power in the executive branch. And this case is known as Morrison v. Olson. And v means versus. So it's Morrison versus Olson, Morrison v. Olson. And Scalia is the only guy who says, you know, we need a unitary executive at the time. It's kind of a wacko idea. Everybody else, including the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, who was William Rehnquist, who was the intellectual, the conservative intellectual leader of the court in this period, says, no, obviously you've gone way too far with this unitary executive. However, that idea of the unitary executive had become gradually um, when uh, Scalia worked closely with the Federalist Society, which is a group of lawyers who believe in things like the unitary executive, and that Federalist Society increasingly since the 1980s, after this Morrison v. Olson decision, has impacted who gets to be a judge in America. They have made recommendations and Republican presidents tend to have simply looked at a list of judges approved by the Federalist Society and put them in power. So, for example, right now, uh, our Attorney General William Barr is a firm believer in the unitary executive, and he insists that it has been the case in America that we've had this unitary executive since the very beginning. I'm a historian, that's simply wrong. But he believes it very closely. Similarly, when Kavanaugh was asked about what Supreme Court decision he would like to get rid of in 2016, he answered that he would, and this is a quote, like to put a nail in, unquote, Morrison v. Olson. He wants to get rid of Morrison v. Olson, which is the, the, the decision that says that is against the unitary executive. He would like to get rid of that decision. Okay, so um, so this is a real concern for me because this idea of the unitary executive is um, deeply seated now in the Federalist Society. And because under Trump especially, um, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is putting judges in so quickly across the federal bench. Remember, they just bang, 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 bang through these judges so that Trump has put more judges in power in this three years of his term than Obama did in his eight. Um, we are getting more and more people in the federal courts who believe in this unitary executive, this extraordinary executive power. All right. Um, that's one of my concerns. The other one of my concerns about what increasingly seems like a move toward um, uh, uh, too strong, in my mind, an executive uh, and too strong and, uh, and toward a dictatorship is another complicated concept. And this one actually worries me even more than the unitary executive. And that is the concept of non-delegation. And the non-delegation doctrine, you know, it's kind of annoying. It, it is descriptive. Both of these are descriptive, but they're, they make things sound much more complicated than they are. The non-delegation doctrine says that Congress cannot delegate its powers, that under the Constitution, uh, Congress has the power to legislate, but it does not have the power to delegate that power to legislate. Well, why do we care about this? We care about this because if Congress cannot delegate its powers, it cannot establish agencies. That is, when Congress, for example, develops the Environmental Protection Agency, it does, or, or the Fish and Game people, it does not say to the Fish and Game people that 
you know, fishermen off the coast of the Atlantic have to have 75 shrimp per net um, it, it, or, or 150 shrimp per net or whatever they make up for rules. Because Congress, if it tried to do that, would spend its entire time worrying about how many shrimp should go in each net. So instead what they do is they say, we're going to create an agency. And that agency is going to have the power to determine how many shrimp fishermen should take this year, or how many birds should uh, should be allowed to to how many birds a, a duck hunter can get, and that delegation power is the centerpiece of what I talk about so much: the idea of a government that regulates business primarily, but also provides a basic social safety net and um, and promotes infrastructure. Because if you can't, if Congress can't delegate its power. Think about it. There go all of our regulations because Congress, can you imagine Congress trying to delegate or trying to talk even about how to build a house? You know, what are the safety rules for a house? This is why we have so many agencies in place after the New Deal to go ahead and make these regulations. Well, this non-delegation doctrine, the idea that Congress cannot delegate its powers, actually went before the Supreme Court in 1928. And in 1928, the Supreme Court said, yes, Congress can go ahead and do this. However, uh, it, it says it can do so because it's an impl in implied power under the Constitution. However, you know this is coming, right? However, modern America. 2019, there's a Supreme Court case called Gundy v. United States. And it's a, you know, all those Supreme Court cases are incredibly complicated and they argue for hours and hours and hours and hours and they're long and they're hard to read. And at the end, there's like one nugget. So I'm not going to tell you, I mean, I shouldn't say that probably every lawyer there is probably going to write me angry notes, but, um, but Gundy is important because, um, Gundy is the question, essentially the larger question of non, of the non-delegation argument. Can Congress delegate its powers? And in the Gundy, v, uh, the Gundy v. United States, the Gundy v. United States decision of 2019, only eight of the justices weighed in because Brett Kavanaugh was not yet on the court. So he hadn't heard the arguments. He was actually on the court by the time they decided, but he hadn't heard the oral arguments, so he was not allowed to weigh in. Nonetheless, this, the, the Supreme Court split four to four, in which, uh, which meant that the, the previous uh, decision would stand. And they split four to four over whether or not uh, Congress could delegate its powers. When that happened, Brett Kavanaugh wrote quite a long letter about the case. He couldn't weigh in on the case itself, but he wrote quite a long letter about the case saying it was high time that the Supreme Court revisited the question of the delegation of powers. And the argument about um, the delegation uh, theory, the theory of non-delegation, is that what conservatives or, or people who call themselves conservatives, um, the political movement of conservatives known as movement conservatism, what they say is the government has run amok. There's just way too much of it and we need to get rid of it altogether and the, the, of all these regulations and all these agencies and all these things that are sort of mucking up the American system. And in order to do that, we need to get rid of this non-delegation clause. Well, again, People believe that, obviously smart people believe that. I look at that and I say, that takes out government regulation. I mean, how, there goes all our government regulation because if Congress can't regulate that, it will simply freeze the government and push us right back in essentially to the 1920s when any kind of work with between business and the government had to be handled by the executive branch. That executive branch, which is now being pushed as a unitary executive. So when people ask me, um, should I be concerned about, um, about the rise of dictatorship in America? Yes, absolutely yes. But not in a sweeping law that's going to come overnight. It's in these little incremental pieces here and there that are sweeping away the norms of our society that we have had since the New Deal. The idea of government regulation, the idea of a basic social safety net, and the idea of infrastructure that will enable all of us to have equality of opportunity. All of those things hinge on Supreme Court decisions and judges and laws, yes, but on, um, on these, these guardrails in our society, which are, um, I would say, breaking down. Other people would say being built to a different place. And you can decide how you feel about that. But that, to me, is the major issue that we have to look at when we look at the rise of um, 
a dictatorship. One of the other pieces here that I want to throw out is the, the issue of the fact that, again, the Supreme Court in 2013 eviscerated the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And that uh, evisceration of that law in the Supreme Court decision Shelby v. Holder meant that um, the, the that areas that had been in the past known for voter suppression no longer had to get approval from the federal government to go and change their voting um, their voting laws. And the minute, literally the minute, I mean within hours that uh, that Shelby v. Holder was decided, Shelby uh, Shelby County v. Holder was decided. A number of states instantly put in place uh, a number of voting restrictions that made it far more difficult for people presumed to be Democrats to vote. So again, very hard to change these laws if you have voter suppression. All right. So next, um, you know, somebody just I'm, I'm trying to catch out of my eye. I'm seeing things go through. Someone said this is freaking scary. Yeah, it's scary. You know, why do you think I stay up until four o'clock in the morning every day writing these letters? But but this is going to end on a hopeful note. Um, we've been in similar places before, and there are ways to get out of them because we care about democracy. All right, so here's another good question. Um, Sean Hessler asked, are there cycles or at least threads of waxing and waning regarding anti-intellectualism? Um, I keep thinking of the rise of the evangelical right in this moment of scientific denialism. So. So you guys all should basically just turn off your computers now because this is like my kind of favorite question. Um, yes, I, I and I will try to be somewhat brief because I would like to get to more than four of my questions. I love religion. I love the study of religion. Okay, so evangelicism um, and the and evangelical movements have always been part of America, and they're a really important part of American society because they have always, and bear with me here, I'm going to paint with a really broad brush, they have always been the religion of the American West. And I don't mean necessarily west of the Mississippi at this point. I mean the western part of American colonies. And the reason that this happens is because what you get when you settle this country uh, by Europeans is you bring in... Um, uh, you develop cities along the coastline, and those cities tend to have people who accumulate money and therefore education and therefore um, have schools and come to control society. They, they have the money, they have the education, and pretty soon they control the society. And as settlers move west, they resent that. They resent not only that they feel like they're not getting a, um, as much attention in the government, but also because things like in the Carolinas, in North Carolina and South Carolina, uh, they don't actually move courts out to the West. So it's very, very difficult to have any kind of legal system out there. This is why you get the regulators that are part of that Mel Gibson movie that's one of the many bloody Mel Gibson movies, um, The Patriot, I think, where he starts... Um, um, you know, it starts with him being a regulator. The regulators are fascinating, by the way, if anybody's interested, there was a minister who happened to be out with the North Carolina reg uh, regulators in colonial, uh, in, I'm sorry, in colonial North Carolina, and he kept a diary. So we have that, and it's fabulous reading. Anyway, so there's always been, when that, when those people start to get, uh, feeling like the government is not answering to them, they tend to develop a religion, an evangelical religion that claims to be hearkening back to the old forms of American religion in which there is an individual relationship between an individual and God without the mediation of those educated people, those ministers and, and those legal people back east. So from the, the early years of America, we get, for example, the first Great Awakening, and the second Great Awakening is in the early 19th century. There's another Great Awakening, if you will. It's not called that in the late 19th century. Uh, it's a very interesting one as well. We come very close, actually, to getting a constitutional amendment saying that America is a Christian nation. It gets put down. People have always forgotten that. And then you could argue that we are once again in another Great Awakening. So there's always this anti-intellectualism. I'm as good as you, even if I'm sitting out here on the frontier in my log cabin, because I God sees me as as good as you are. And you will remember if you did the history thing on Thursday, that's a lot of Puritanism. So there's a lot of that going on. So that that has always gone on in American history and it's always fascinating that way. And if you think right now about where evangelicism is the strongest in America, it's in the American West and the American South, uh, but especially the American West. So you have some of the, the big, well, I don't have time to go into that right now. Anyway, so yes, there are these cycles, but, but, this anti-intellectualism and um, and the 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 
link to evangelicism is especially strong right now. And the reason for that is because it has become part of our political lexicon. And the reason for this, uh, this is actually really, if you think about it, this is the first time since the 1830s with Andrew Jackson that anti-intellectualism and not the evangelicism, but the anti-intellectualism of society has taken over American government. And the reason for this is, again, a story of modern America. The story is that um, coming out of the New Deal and World War II, these times when America had to develop extraordinarily complex governmental systems, first to combat the depression and then to fight a world war. Coming out of that, the world that gets very complicated, you've got these agencies and you've got government giving money to all sorts of countries and it's very, very hard to understand what's going on. And when that happens, the president first after World War II is Truman and then Eisenhower. And, uh, and Dwight Eisenhower is a Republican, and he firmly, he's a really smart man, and he firmly believes in, um, mind you, he made mistakes. Somebody's, I'm certain, going to say, what about Iran? Yes, he made mistakes. But he really believed in working with very smart people across the spectrum to go ahead and come up with really good decisions about American society. Well, when he does that, it leaves him wide open for a challenge from the right, from people who say, who want to get power by saying, you know, this is black and white and you are muddying the waters. And this is exactly what happens. You have Eisenhower um, talking about working with other countries and talking about NATO and talking about um, desegregation and all these somewhat complicated ideas and philosophically complicated ideas. And you get the rise of Joe McCarthy, uh, the senator from Wisconsin saying, no, it's simple. I'm an anti-communist and you're a communist. It's black and it's white. And what happens beginning with McCarthy in the, 19, um, the 1950s is sort of a Manichaean, that is a black and white division of American society. So that people who are advocating much more complicated approaches to society are essentially um, denigrated as being communists, as working against this simple, we're the good guys in the white hats kind of story. So McCarthy talks about it, and I talked a lot the other day about McCarthy, so I won't go on a great length about him. You know that William F. Buckley Jr. and later his brother, El, uh, his brother-in-law, Albert Bazell, pick up McCarthy's starkness. It's us against you, that, um, that us and them mentality that is so productive for making, for melding a new kind of constituency in the, when you don't have a lot of popularity. But then really importantly, Phyllis Schlafly, if you remember that name, she um, was a was an activist in the Republican Party. Sort of popularizes this idea. If you think about it, even though um, McCar McCarthy claimed to be an outsider, he's a senator, and Buckley's a rich kid who went to Yale. And you know these ideas are not sort of popular ideas. And Schlafly with her book A Choice Not an Echo, when she backs Barry Goldwater in the early '60s, really really popularizes this idea. And she says, you know. People say he's too simple, but 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 the answer is simple. It's good and evil. It's it's us and them. It's capitalism, communism. And what she is doing then is she is pushing back on what she actually calls the Eastern establishment. And that Eastern establishment is embodied for people like McCarthy and Schlafly by Dwight Eisenhower. Because Eisenhower is you know, he, he doesn't want to have an us versus them mentality. He doesn't want to become a dictator. And in fact, when one of uh, a veteran writes to him, a guy named Biggs writes to him and says, you know, give us, just tell us what to do. Make it simple. He says, no, I'm not going to make it simple for you because democracy is hard and it's dictators who make things simple. Well, Phyllis Schlafly helps to popularize this idea of us versus them and of anti-intellectualism. You don't need to have some great degree. You just have to understand. You just have to be one of us, which, by the way, is the same theme as Western evangelicism. It's just you don't have to have this education. As long as you know God has saved you, you're one of the good guys, right? It's the same thing. It's that same uh, po the po po political idea is the same thing as the religious idea. That then um, feeds, of course, into um, the Barry Goldwater campaign, although Goldwater himself was, a, was an not a terribly educated man. He dropped out of college because he didn't like it, but he was a smart man. But it feeds into the Republican Party through uh, Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon is in real trouble. When he's elected in 1968, he... Um, he does not, 
a majority of people cast votes for somebody other than him. He wins. There's no doubt about that. But he doesn't have a popular majority, and he's very aware of that. But he tries. His first couple of, couple of years, or his first year, I guess, he really tries to kind of split the baby and make a lot of people happy. And, um, and it's, of course, an impossible task in the late, late 1960s. And after Kent State, he's in real trouble, which is in May of 1970. He's in real trouble because at that point he loses middle America because uh, he he basically implies that the kids who are killed at Kent State are somehow um, uh, un-American. And when that happens, before the midterms of 1970, his speechwriter Pat Buchanan gets involved and he says, you know, we can get these people back on board. And he does a number of things, but one of the things he says is that um, what we can do is we can divide the population and convince poorer voters that the elites are looking down on them. It's us versus you versus them. And he does this really quite deliberately. We have his memos where he says, you know, we got to turn, turn regular people against those pointy headed elites. And I always love this because Pat Buchanan himself was educated at Georgetown and Columbia. So he's not exactly um, himself a man of the people. But this construction, and, and you see this in Pat Buchanan also saying, like, they say it's better not to work. You know, th there's no they. Nobody said it's better not to work. Pat Buchanan makes up this us versus them. And it becomes part of the Republican lexicon until you see it really, uh, people like Ronald Reagan grabbing a hold of that, grabbing a hold of that anti-intellectualism. And, you know, he often takes pot shots at Harvard in his, uh, in his, um, in his uh, endorsement of Barry Goldwater in um, in uh, 1960, he gives a speech on on TV called a, a choice. Now I'm sorry, called um, a time for choosing. And in that, he goes out of his way to say we don't need Harvard men, and um, and he he keeps saying we don't need these Ivy. Uh, Ivy League intellectuals planning our lives back in uh, in Washington. I trust you to make decisions about your own life. So that anti-intellectualism became really with Reagan a crucial part of um, of the mystique, if you will, of the rising Republican Party. Until now, you have, for example, Louisiana Senator Kennedy, who's a very well-educated man, pretending he's some, you know backwoods hick and uh, Ted Cruz similarly taking pot shots at the highly educated when he himself is a highly educated man. So we have part of the rise of the modern day Republican Party, this anti-intellectualism as a sign that you are of the people, even at the time when your legislation really is uh, is working against the people. All right, so that's that one. Um, how about this one? People are concerned about that signing statement I mentioned. And I would just like to point out here that um, the signing statement point that, that I pointed out is when I wrote about it uh, the, the first night it came out after the, the bill was signed. That's why historians have something new to say about this period is because I saw that and I knew what was going on. A lot of people missed that for a long time. And I knew it because I knew the history of signing statements, which is why historians, as I say, are pretty useful right now, I think. So what's a signing statement and how can Congress fight back against it? A signing statement is uh, has always been around. I think it was Monroe who did the first one, but they were, um, uh, you know, they were just ways to, to thank somebody who'd worked hard on a bill or to say this bill is incredibly important uh, and, you know, and I'm such a great guy because I signed it or whatever. They're, they're, I won't say they're chatty, but they're yeah, the kind of things that end up in history books. Nobody really cares very much about what people said in them. There were only a total of 75 of them in American history before Ronald Reagan. And the, the signing statements start with Ronald Reagan. And he, um, he starts them because he is relying on a young staffer at the Department of Justice to, who says that, um, that if you start using, as he called them, interpretive signing statements, that's a quote, um, they would be a way to, and this is another quote, increase the power of the executive to shape the law, to increase the power of the executive, right? Remember that first law I talked about, I mean, the first Supreme Court decision I talked about, and how there's a move to increase the power of the executive with, in, in 1988 with, um, but at the time it's kind of an outside, an outside idea. Um, well, the person who writes this, this clerk in the Department of Justice, is a guy named Samuel Alito. Yes, 
that Alito, the guy who's going to become a Supreme Court justice and is now in the court. He was an attorney at the Department of Justice in the office of the legal counsel. And when he said in this memo that signing statements could increase the power of the, the president, um, he noted that Congress, quote, is likely to resent the fact that the president will get in the last word on questions of interpretation, unquote. Well, I'm not going to use expletives, but no something, Sherlock. Yeah, Congress is going gonna, is gonna to really resent the idea that the president is trying to horn in on its ability to write the laws, because under the Constitution, the president vows to, um, to uh, I'm see if I can get the quotation here, take, uh, take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Well, you're not faithfully executing the laws as passed if you're changing them. So this is obviously going to be a problem. So what happens from, uh, from this is Reagan starts using them, but you know, I, I won't say no one paid attention. Uh, Reagan does it, but it's, and, and, um, and after, presidents after Reagan do it, but it's really George W. Bush. He does about twice the number of all si signing statements of all the presidents before him combined. He uses them all the time. And the reason that you do it is it's a way, I mean, that a president does it, is that it's a way to disapprove of a bill without actually vetoing it. So that you can get pieces of the bill you want without having all the pieces of the bill that you don't like. So again, for example, uh, President Trump has issued a signing statement over the coronavirus relief and stimulus bill in which he said, you're not going to oversee me. I'm going to have all the rest of it, but I'm not going to have oversight. So he gets the bill without, um, without actually having to approve all of it, theoretically. Now, here's the question. Is it, um, is it constitutional? Uh, lots of thinkers say it's really not. In fact, um, the Supreme Court has never uh, taken it on. There's nothing against a signing statement in the Constitution, but there's nothing in favor of it either. And the Supreme Court has never explicitly taken on a signing statement. It has taken on um, the idea of a line item veto, which is very much what this looks like. And that's the idea that the president can pass a law but cross pieces of it out, which has been uh, advocated repeatedly by different presidents and has been repeatedly declined um, by the, the Congress and the courts. The Supreme Court did take on um, the line item veto in 1998 with a Supreme Court case called Clinton v. United, uh, v. City of New York, and it declined to let the president use the line item veto. So it's likely, I mean, I shouldn't say anything is likely at this point. More importantly, uh, or not more importantly, uh, the American Bar Association has weighed in on the use of signing statements, and it condemns it. Bipartisan, uh, a bipartisan commission of the American Bar Association said that it's an intrusion of the president onto Congress's power. All right, so what's going to happen with this coronavirus bill? People are saying, is there anything Congress can do to make sure that there is oversight? In fact, the people writing the bill were not stupid. They had every expectation that uh, Trump would do something like this. And so what they did is they built into the bill a number of levels of oversight, some of which are already, uh, are, are, are they're organizing committees to oversee the expenditure of the money appropriated in the coronavirus bill already. Before anybody's even thinking about writing checks, they're already pulling together those oversight boards. And you know, we'll see, we'll see how it works. But, but that being said, it doesn't do anybody good to have that that money be wasted. It's pretty clear people are going to be looking after how it goes. And if you are a member of Congress, why would you set yourself up for this? Just put up the put the guardrails up ahead of time, and and if you're going to steal money, do it somewhere else. It would be my guess. So there will will there be waste? Of course, there's always waste on some kind on any kind of contracts, um, and they're not going to do it the way you or I would. But uh, I'm guessing that the signing statement was just once again Trump's effort to um, to uh, to to expand his own power and to have his own teeth onto this bill. All right. Uh, another question here. Hope you guys are doing okay on this. Um, another question here. Um, was there, a, from Amy Guinness Clark, was there a point where the Democrats and the Republicans swapped beliefs compared to their current respective programs? And, um, and this is an incredibly complicated question, and I'm going to focus on one aspect of this. But the answer is yes. And this is, you know, you see this fought 
all the time. I'm not going to mention his name, but there's somebody on Twitter who is who who just cannot let this go. He's a person of some um, of some um, prominence, and you know, every time you turn around, he's going, "Oh, the Democrats were the KKK," or you know, they're still the same. The Democrats are the ones who who refused civil rights, and you know. Of course they were. I mean, that's the, the that was the 19th century. There was a whole 19th century, and it was half of the 20th century. Um, but the party switched sides, and so you know, it, it just it's so tiresome. So let me explain how um, how that worked. The Democrats in the 19th century and into the 20th century were the party of white supremacy, and I'm not going to belabor that um, because uh, it's a whole book, but but. Yeah, they're the, they're the ones who are pushing slavery. They're the ones who get taken over by um, by elite slaveholders. They want to start a society that's based on human enslavement. I mean, it's all about white supremacy for the Democrats. And now, not entirely. I mean, I could talk about Grover Cleveland um, because I feel certain that that would excite you all so much that you wouldn't even remember that you're stuck at home. Um, however, I'm going to deprive you of learning more about Grover Cleveland right now. Um, so I, that's a very broad brush, but yes, the Democratic platform generally until uh, the mid 20th century was about white supremacy. The Republicans, in contrast, began in 1854, really, but they really organized in 56 on a different kind of platform. And it was not a platform of equality on which they originally organized for the gazillionth time. They were very concerned about oligarchy taking over American democracy. And that oligarchy was fueled by human enslavement. The oligarchs they were concerned about were the ones who owned human beings, who owned slavery. So our early Republicans did not like the institution of slavery. They did not want human beings to be enslaved. They did not necessarily want black rights. They just didn't want um, African Americans to be enslaved and to bring extraordinary money to an oligarchy. That's going to change over the course of the Civil War. And by 1865, really by 1864, um, Lincoln has um, signed the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, but he's really concerned that that is going to um, expire with the end of the war because he does it under the war powers, under the fact he has extraordinary powers during the war and he's afraid it's not going to last. So in 64, when he runs for office, again, thinking he's going to lose in the summer of 64, he says to the Republican Party, I want my platform to be about an amendment to the Constitution that ends slavery. And they're like, geez, dude, you know, it's not gonna, that's not really gonna go real well. And he's like, I don't care, that's what I wanna stand on. Mind you, that's a paraphrase of American history. There's a little more detail than that. But so in 1865, he wins, of course, not because people are lining up for black rights, although a lot more people have been convinced by the performance of African Americans on the battlefields than certainly were in favor of black rights in the 18, early 1860s. Um, it, but he really wins based on the fact that the Union government, that the Union troops are winning all over uh, the country by 64, and his opponent wants a negotiated settlement, and so people are like, we'd much rather go with Lincoln. Anyway, in 65, the Republican Party puts its signature issue on the table, which is the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. Then with the 14th Amendment to the Constitution in 1868, we get the establishment of African-American citizenship and all the rights of, uh, of American citizenship, and that's a huge deal. And then in 1870, we get the 15th Amendment to the Constitution. All three of those amendments to the Constitution um, give African-American men equal rights to white men before the law. And the 15th Amendment provides that you can't discriminate against somebody in terms of voting based on their race, color, or previous condition of servitude. That, um, that law does, though, introduce the word male into the Constitution for the first time, by the way. But all three of those amendments to the Constitution, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, all increase the power of the federal government for the first time. All our previous um, amendments decrease the power of the federal government, that increased the power of the federal government. All right, well, the Republican Party then is launched as, um, by then, is launched on a course of protecting black rights. And I am so not going to rehearse the history of Reconstruction right here because I only have 15 minutes, not 15 years. But that idea that Republicans care about civil rights is not a bad one to go forward with, although really they're going to drop the ball really dramatically after, um, at least after the assassination of Garfield in 1881. Um, 
Garfield cares about black rights, but after that, the Republicans really don't. Um, so, uh, Teddy Roosevelt maybe puts his toes in the water, but you d don't even start me on on Harding. Um, uh, I'll stop. All right. So, um, so the Republican Party really is um, is uh, the, the idea that African they, they care about black voting, and they don't really do anything in the twenties and the thirties, not so much. But what happens is in the thirties is something really important, and that's that when FDR um, starts to institute the New Deal and starts to say, you know, we all need to work together, and everybody belong this government belongs to everybody, and all that. Um, the actually it's the the he starts to court african americans and his wife uh, eleanor roosevelt actually the her his opponents tried to discredit his administration by circulating a picture of her with african american um veterans i think it is or maybe cadets military cadets and um and and she's supposed to run and scream and say no i i, I don't want any part of african americans and she says yeah yeah, I, I took a picture with him and, and, you know, I'm all in favor of black rights. And of course, she is the one who arranges for Marian Anderson to sing on the steps of the uh, Lincoln Memorial when um, the Daughters of the American Revolution won't let her sing in Constitution Hall in Washington. So with the 30s, there is this sense from people like Eleanor Roosevelt that African Americans should have equal rights in American society. And I have made that sound like a white down story, if you will. But the, the larger truth is that FDR desperately needs the support of African American workers. And it's some of the, the African American union leaders like A. Philip Randolph who come to, to FDR and say, dude, you know, start doing something for us for a change. And they really kind of back him into having to do something for African Americans, not everything for African Americans. There's always in the in the New Deal legislation, there's always a differential between the benefits that white people get and the benefits that black people get, along including the fact that the that Social Security, for example, does not cover uh, domestic workers or farm workers, which are of course overwhelmingly African Americans, especially in the South. But the the Democrats start to pay attention to black black people. And there's that famous line about how um, a black leader says um, to to um, to to his uh, to people who are asking him how to vote, you know, turn your picture of Lincoln to the wall. Uh, that debt is paid in full. Back FDR. Well, so so coming out of the New Deal and out of World War II, it looks like African Americans some of them might be switching to the Democratic Party. And Eisenhower is very aware of that. So Eisenhower makes a big play to get African-American voters back into the fold. And again, not I I've talked a lot in the past about how he cares about, um, about ending discrimination because it's such a powerful weapon for uh, um, communists to use against America. But he also cares about it uh, morally, but then he also cares, uh, I shouldn't have said that so dismissively, he cares about it morally, but he also cares about it because he'd like the votes after all. And um, and he would like to see more, uh, Not there's a lot of people, black people who aren't voting, but there are a lot of pe black people who still are able to vote and he would like those black votes. And so he actually is the first to put a, a black um, uh, officer in the White House. So, um, and there's a, a, a great biography of that man. So Eisenhower's making a ploy for African Americans to rejoin the Republican Party. And a number of them certainly are very active, including people like Jackie Robinson, who is uh, a, a fervent Republican um, and who uh, goes to the Republican National Conventions and, and all that. So how does so how does that change? Like I'm talking Eisenhower, this is not within my lifetime, but pretty close to it. So how do they switch? Well, as Eisenhower begins to push for black rights, I I've talked about this on a number of platforms recently, Southern Democrats are horrified. They don't want desegregation. They don't want, after Brown v. Board of Education, they don't want desegregated schools. They sure don't like the to integrate Central High School at Little Rock. And so they start to organize either behind the Democratic Party, but you know, the Democrats are doing kind of funky stuff over there too. And in the, the, uh, the, the late 50s and into the early 60s, a number of Democrats organize as what are called Dixiecrats. And the leader of the Dixiecrats is Strom Thurmond of South Carolina. And he's an incredibly interesting, complicated character. And, um, and I think a loathsome character personally. Um, 
Strom Thurmond, who, by the way, has um, fathered a child with the family's maid as a young man, that doesn't come to light for a long time after that, is a fervent believer in segregation. I know, go figure. But anyway, um, so he, uh, he doesn't want any part of this whole idea of letting African Americans have any kind of say in American society. So how does this switch take place? The switch takes place because in the... Um, the uh, election of 1960, um, the, uh, the, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. The 60, the Goldwater, when, when Barry Goldwater runs for president, um, I'm sorry, in 64, when Goldwater runs for president, that's, that's my problem, it's 64 that Goldwater runs. Um, he, he, Barry Goldwater runs on the platform that this whole New Deal government, this whole activist government is in fact um, perverting American society. It's a form of communism. And he runs on the idea that not only should we get rid of business regulation and the taxes that those require, we should get rid of the kinds of legislation that have come out of Brown v. Board of Education and out of the, the legislation after that to try and promote African American equality of opportunity. And he actually says that things like uh, Brown v. Board of Education is unconstitutional. When that happens, and Barry Goldwater is of course running as a Republican, when that happens, Strom Thurmond very publicly switches sides from the Democrats to the Republicans. I mean, it's a, it's a really big deal when he does that. And Barry Goldwater goes down in flames in 64, of course, but when he goes down in flames, he wins his home state of Arizona. Virtually everybody wins their home state of Arizona. Not always, but almost always. Um, but he also gets five deep Southern states. And it's pretty clear he's got those Southern states because he has come out against desegregation and the federal enforcement of desegregation. Um, so, so where does that go from there? It's still not clear that the Republicans, Barry Goldwater is a bit of a flash in the pan or so it seems. It turns out in retrospect he's not, but it seems like he might be, and it's not entirely clear that that's that the Republican Party is going to, um, to, to go down that road. So what happens is when Nixon runs in 18, 19, 1968, he's got to figure out how to nail together some kind of a coalition. And rather than courting the African-American vote the way his uh, previous boss did, the way Eisenhower had, he decides to go the Barry Goldwater route. And he actually, he needs, um, he, he knows he's not going to get all the Dixiecrats, but if he can get the moderate, not the Dixiecrats, they're not really moderate, but if he can get the white Southern voters to get behind his candidacy, he's going to be able to nail together a coalition to win. So he goes and he talks to Strom Thurmond and he says, if you will back me uh, in a Republican in this moment, I promise I will not use the federal government to, to continue to promote desegregation. And Strom Thurmond, in fact, does back him. And this is what becomes known later as the Southern strategy, as people like um, political operative Lee Atwater called it. That idea of trying to nail together a Republican coalition of people opposed to integration and opposed to um, federal regulation, that really takes root uh, in the Republican Party in 1968, but it's not clear that that's actually the way Richard Nixon is going to, to govern because as I say, he really does try and play the middle of the road for a long time until he gets so mired in Vietnam and his own paranoia that he kind of completely goes off the rails. Um, but it, it takes over the Republican Party itself, not simply um, Nixon's flirting with it, with Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan very deliberately and in his very genteel sounding language plays on this idea of backing away from desegregation and backing away from using the government to promote equality of opportunity for African Americans. Um, he gives his speech accepting the nomination for president uh, in a place right where, um, right next to where, in Mississippi, right next to where three civil, right wor civil rights workers had been killed in the struggles of the 1960s. And he says quite explicitly in that, um, in that speech, I believe in states' rights. So that switch really takes place right around the 1960s. And I don't think I have to play out much from there where it goes. In, um, in, uh, in 1960, 
as I've talked about before, JF, JFK is elected and, and during his brief term, he promotes black rights. And by 64, you've got um, Lynn, Lyndon Baines Johnson, LBJ, all in for promoting a war on poverty, as he said, which disproportionately helps people of color. So you have this real split right there in the 1960s between the Republicans, where the Republicans go and where the Democrats go. And it, it's really, it's dramatic and it's really incredibly clear and obvious. All right. Uh, so, um, so, uh, so I wanted to end on, uh, on a positive note after all this. So I'm going to take one last question here about uh, where we are right now. And it's a question from Danny Smart. And Danny said, are there examples in other countries where a specific challenge to public health caused a change in how services were provided? And I have given you here a really, uh, really a dark vision of American society. And you probably know by now, I am an optimist about American society. I care deeply about American government and I, um, and, and about our, about the way American life plays out. And ultimately, you know, we have come close to dictatorship in the past. We have screwed things up again and again and again. And ultimately we usually managed to pull ourselves, or until now we've managed to pull ourselves out of the ditch. And I have every reason to, to hope anyway that we're going to do it again here. And so I'm going to answer Danny's question, not as an example from another country, but rather an example from this country in um, the late 19th century. And it involves the man who articulated a new vision of a Republican party in the early 20th century, but who really drew from Lincoln on the way he thought about American government. And that, of course, is Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt, who is going to be not the progenitor of the progressive era, but really the person who puts it on the map. And the reason Teddy Roosevelt is significant right now, I think, and I've been thinking a lot about him in this moment, is because Teddy Roosevelt lived in New York City in the Gilded Age, and it was gross. It was filthy. I mean, so they have a real problem in the, in um, New York City as it grows dramatically after um, after the after really people are putting up factories after the 1870s. By the 1880s, it's run by trusts. It's run by governments who by by the Tweed Ring that won't clean up the streets. You know, when horses die, they leave them there to rot because the knackers aren't really great about picking them up, and they get full of disease and and there's sewage in the streets and everything is dirty and um, and the, the factories pour their, their garbage into the streets and the tenements have everyone packed in together and, and people can't make a living and uh, children are, are, are not in school because they have to work to support their families and they're losing their fingers and their arms in factories or they're prostituting themselves on the streets. It's, he looks at it and, and it's not the America that he believes in. It's not the America that he has seen Lincoln advocate and that people died for in his lifetime when he was a little boy he remembers seeing the the uh soldiers march by his home and he looks at this and he says you know this is really not the way america should be but you know i'm a rich guy and my life's pretty good and he's married to somebody he really loves and she's gonna have a baby and he's in the uh legislature and in February of 1884, he does. You know, he has this great, this baby comes and he has this great life and his wife is home with his mother in New York City. And he gets the news about the baby being born and that everybody seems to be doing well. And then he gets a telegram saying, you better come home. And he goes home and on February 14th, 1884, both his wife and his mother die in his arms, both of them at the same, on the same day, a number of hours apart, and there's nothing he can do to save them. And they die of diseases that have been brought into his home by the workers, who the servants in the house, and the people on the streets. And he realizes that there is no way he can protect his home and family, and that he can protect the society he cares about, so long as other people don't have access to clean streets and good food, and education and health care and cleaning up America, first New York City and then America, come, becomes for him not only a goal for the country, but also a profound form of self-protection that he knows he can't enjoy America unless everybody 
can enjoy America. And it's from that we get our first great progressive movement in America from a moment that looks very much like this, when the diseases of the people are infecting everybody, regardless of how rich you are or how well-educated you are or how well-connected you are. And he recognizes that those are the very people who have to turn around and regulate our economy protect our social safety net and promote the ability of everybody to have a quality of opportunity. So yes, there is an example where a, a specific challenge to a public health issue created a new kind of government and it was our country in 1884 first and then in the early 20th century. And nothing right now reminds me more of that. I hope you all enjoyed this. Again, I'm Heather Cox Richardson. I'm a historian. I don't speak for my employer. Uh, and I'm always happy to take your questions. And I hope this was useful. If so, I'll see you again next Tuesday. And if anybody wants to keep going with the history, uh, the history um, talk on Thursday afternoons at 1 o'clock, I'll be picking up the Constitution and, uh, and the coming of the Civil War this Thursday at 1 o'clock based on the new book, which is out, I think, tomorrow. Um, how the South won the Civil War, the uh, oligarchy, democracy, and the continuing fight for the soul of America. As you can tell, I care about that continuing fight. Thank you very much.